Interado. A pleasant good morning to, all, to our distinguished ministers, heads of delegation, delegates, and guests. On behalf of the Philippines as the 2015 host economy, I wish to share with you all how delighted and honored we are as chair of the APEC Women and the Economy 2015 for Fora. I convey my warmest welcome to everyone from all over Asia Pacific. Welcome to Manila. Mabuhay po kayong lahat. I know you are all fully dedicated to the sessions that will follow. I also hope you will take time to enjoy our country, the land of smiles, of friendly and hospitable people, with its tropical setting and delightful culinary offerings. Before we start with the discussions, I wish to share with you all a short video presentation from the APEC Secretariat to remind and give us a quick snapshot of what APEC is all about and how it operates in order to advance free trade for Asia Pacific prosperity. Our world is getting smaller. People, businesses, and economies grow closer together. At APEC, we imagine the possibilities when there is dialogue and cooperation. When diverse communities work together through trade, good things can happen. More choices for consumers. More business opportunities. More jobs. And better standards of living for all. At APEC, we make this a reality by advancing free trade for Asia-Pacific prosperity. Established in 1989 with 12 economies, APEC's membership now totals 21. Recognizing the pace of implementation for differing levels of economic development, APEC leaders in Bogor, Indonesia committed in 1994 to achieve the goal of free and open trade and investment in the Asia-Pacific no later than 2020. This is the fundamental commitment that shapes most of what we do. So how have we set about achieving these goals? Through three broad work areas, trade and investment liberalization, business facilitation, and economic and technical cooperation, also known as Apex Three Pillars. The first pillar, trade and investment liberalization focuses on opening up markets and integrating economies in the region. The second, Business facilitation aims to improve the ease of doing business and reduce trading costs across economies. The third, economic and technical cooperation enables businesses to take advantage of global trade in a sustainable way. APEC helps the transition towards regional economic integration by ensuring that people are well placed to gain from global trade in the long term. From helping small businesses get loans and access foreign markets, to educating youth in the use of information technology, and empowering women to play a bigger role in APEC economies. A tough challenge, sure, but consider this. There have been significant reductions in average tariffs in APEC over the past 20 years. Trade facilitation, which makes it easier, cheaper, and faster to trade across borders, has also saved businesses billions of dollars with initiatives like simplifying customs procedures and making it quicker for business people to travel with the APEC Business Travel Card. Structural reform makes doing business easier and helps ensure higher quality growth across the APEC region by promoting competition and developing stronger social safety nets. APEC's work on reducing tariffs positively impacts trade and investment and overall development. Over a span of 10 years, the GDP of many APEC economies grew dramatically. Employment increased significantly and poverty was greatly reduced. Going beyond traditional trade and investment areas, APEC also undertakes work that reflects new regional challenges. 
implementing projects that help the region reduce disruptions in the supply chain in the event of a disaster, developing guidelines and building the capacity of economies and businesses to help them deal with pandemics, and focusing on strengthening energy security to help build a sustainable future. But as the world grows ever smaller and economies grow closer, Apex's role becomes ever greater and more relevant. So that as incomes rise, poverty falls, and the gap between developing and industrialized economies narrows, there really can be progress for all. APEC, advancing free trade for Asia Pacific prosperity. The year 1996 was significant for it was in that year that the Women Leaders Network was founded. Although it was an informal dynamic network and was not even part of the official APEC structure, it has called the attention of APEC officials to come up with policy rec recommendations that benefit women in Asia Pacific. Two years later, after the first APEC ministerial meeting was, was held in Makati, Philippines. And with this, the, publish, the publication of the framework for integration of women in APEC was done. Today, after almost two decades, the APEC Women and the Economy Fora is in the Philippines again. Today, we are holding the public-private dialogue on women and the economy. We are gathering today more than 800 people registered as delegates, including all the close-in staff and in interpreters. 88% are women, and thank you, men, you represent 12%. Fifty-eight percent of those registered come from the private sector, and more than half of you guys here are CEOs, founders, and managing directors. Forty-two percent are from the pub public sector. Two-thirds are ministers, secretaries, ambassadors, deputy ministers, undersecretaries, and dis directors. And I would say, wow. There are 19 economies represented today, Delega delegations headed mainly by ministers and deputy ministers. And, and what is different this year? We have 30 students that are observing us today. And this time, I'd like to recognize the students of the Philippine Women's University. PWU is Asia's first women college established in 1919 by seven women from the Philippines. We took into account the pillars of the APEC uh, host, the Philippines, and we recognize that there are four pillars. One, enhancing the regional integra economic integration. Second, fostering SMEs participation in the regional and global markets. Third, investing in human capital development. And fourth, building sustainable and resilient communities. We reached an overall theme to, uh, for this uh, fora entitled, Women as Prime Movers of Inclusive Growth. This reflects the growing recognition of the role and the power of women to spur business and economic growth. The theme was decided after a series of consultations that have been made with government agencies, private sector, academe, and civil society. And through the guidance of the Department of Foreign Affairs, who has engineered the Troika, the Department of Trade and Industry, the Philippine Commission on Women, and Women's Business Council of the Philippines, the organizing committee of this year's fora has been formed 
with the Department of Trade and Industry being on the top. This organization has also paved way for a much stronger collaboration with the private sector, who in fact is leading the preparations of the APEC public-private dialogue that we are holding today. Thank you, women in business in the Philippines, for helping me organize this event. And I wish to also recognize the efforts done by the Policy Partnership on Women and the Economy, the working group arm of the APEC We and the Economy, which is being chaired by the Philippine Commission on Women for the su successful first PPWE meeting in Papua New Guinea and the second PPWE meeting held yesterday. Please accept my congratulations for finally coming up with its own strategic plan for the years 2015 to 2018, which lays down the specific objectives, targets, and desired outcomes which support integration of gender responsive policies and programming to promote stronger cross-fora collaboration and to further advance women's economic empowerment and gender equality goals across APEC work streams. Things have changed. 20 years ago, the global economy had 500 million participants. Today, it's 7 billion. The population of the world has in it more than 50% being women. Let me cite some of the trends that are for our consideration as we move forward to forge greater collaboration. The World Bank reports that the largest economies in the world with more than two trillion nominal GDP are the following. The United States, China, Japan, Germany, France, the United Kingdom and India. APEC contribute largely to the global economy with three of the largest economies contributing over 15% share in global GDP. 25 of the 25 largest economies, I'm sorry, 10 out of the 25 largest economies are actually in the APEC region. E-Marketer reports that the 2014 worldwide B2C commerce reached 1.5 trillion sales. Growth came primarily from the rapidly expanding online and mobile user bases in emerging markets, increases in mobile commerce sales, advancing shipping and payment options, and the push into new international markets by major brands. In 2014, consumers in Asia Pacific spent more on e-commerce purchases than those in North America. Asia Pacific will claim more than 46% of digital buyers worldwide, and through the users will and their users will only account for 16.9% of the region's population. Women influence the greater majority of purchasing decisions in the US. Over 85% of all purchasing decisions are made by women. In the US, women spend $5 trillion annually, over half of the US GDP. I'm sure the other US economy also has this similar trend. Women are adopting technology. Women in the Western countries use internet 17% more than their male counterparts. They use their mobile phones more, use location-based services more, are the fastest growing and largest number of users of Skype, and use most social media sites more often. They are also the majority of the owners of tech devices. And sure enough, we know that there are storms brewing and we see them already. You know it's disruptive. Gartner calls them the nexus of forces. These are the clouds, social media, big data, and mobility. We wonder how this will impact the new world of work today and how this will impact women. Virtualization, which began in 1960 as a method of logically dividing the system resources through the mainframe computers, have now evolved 
with the cloud holdi holding forces a social computing and mobility together, it has created a new concept of work. The upside of this is that more people, especially women, can work from home. And for many companies, the need for a physical location is either dwindling or disappearing. Business is becoming fluid and how it operates and the driving force behind is the digital marketplace that connects the buyers with sellers faster. In the coming years, millennials will be 50% of our workforce. They will have greater purchasing power because of their education and because they of their influence. This generation, born between 1977 and 1995, will influence the way we work. And many of them are women. Millennials will account for more than one-third of all retail spending in five years. Millennials see women impact the workforce and the business, and there is no, no misconception that women are limited in either career or family. Yet, study shows, says the World Economic Forum, that there is still some work to be done, especially in the gender pay gap. Compared to the overall national average of women earning, we see a discrepancy. In Canada, 72% is what's being earned by women if, if a man earns $100. And that is in the US, it's 66%. In China, it is 63%. Women's innate qualities involve being a nurturer, nourisher, grower, teacher, and motivator. It could be further unleashed by exploring and, and treading more avenues for participation in economic activities and empowering them and creating a wide reaching ripples in their respective communities. Women can go further than what we can imagine. Back to this fora. For this year's fora, the Philippines have lined up 18 official APEC events, and there are simultaneous activities that the private sector have initiated. The other day, for the first time, women opens the market at the Philippine Stock Exchange with Corporate Women Directors International. Today is the main event for us I highly encourage everyone to participate in today's session at the PPDWE, and we plan to make this more interactive and engaging through the use of mobile application. Please download it now. In the pursuit of our agenda for the advancement of women and gender equality, we have lined up a wide range of topics, and just to name them, the sessions this afternoon will be Women in the International Markets and Global Value Chain, Women and Inclusive Business, and Women and Sustainable Development. Meanwhile, look around, smile, rekindle your ties, make new friends, and widen the circle of networking prospects across the region. I wish you all a very successful event today Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Undersecretary Nora K. Tarado. Continuing our opening ceremonies, she is the chair for the APEC Business Advisory Council and the president and CEO of Magsaysay Maritime Corporation. To give her opening speech, please welcome Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho. Chair of APEC uh, World uh, Women in the Economy um, 2015 Forum, 
women in APEC, colleagues and friends. Um, this, year is, this year, APEC and ABAC work programs are centered on the theme of inclusive growth. This is not a new objective for APEC. But when leaders met first in Blake Island 22 years ago, they committed to a shared vision of achieving stability, security, and prosperity for our people. In Bogor, a year later, they began the process of pursuing this by committing to the goals of free and open trade and investment in the region. Since then, the progressive reduction of, of barriers to trade and goods has led to the unprecedented expansion of economic growth and international trade and investment in the region and the single biggest reduction in poverty in history. Despite these great benefits, however, there is a widening gap between those that have and those that don't. It is in this context that ABAC examined our priorities to ensure that we are pursuing an agenda of inclusive growth as a means to give people at the bottom of the pyramid, many of whom are women, the same opportunities. We are excited by the possibilities because the convergence of globalization and technology gives everyone great opportunity never ever experienced before. This of course was not always the case. In the early 1900s, a Canadian author and social activist, Nelly McClung, led a fight for women to be qualified persons eligible to sit in the Senate. After she won on appeal from the Supreme Court, she predicted that one day women are going to form a chain, a greater sisterhood than the world has ever known. Looking around this room and seeing so many inspiring women leaders and game changers from across the APEC region, this great sisterhood has indeed become a strong and formidable chain of women and of course now including men because we have inclusivity, right, Ambassador? <laughs> Working together with a sense of purpose to give women access to choice, to pursue financial independence, and to achieve, achieve their own personal vision for themselves. As the chair mentioned, this public-private dialogue on women and the economy was conceived 19 years ago during the launching of the Women's Senior, Senior Leaders Network in 1996 here in Manila. That inaugural meeting called for the mainstreaming of gender perspective in APEX work. In November 1996, APEC leaders directed the ministers to put great special emphasis on the full participation of women and youth in APEX economic cooperation agenda. That was the first time the word women found its way into the APEC leaders declaration. What have we achieved over the past 19 years and why do we continue to meet today? For me, this dialogue is particularly important as it allows us to share our own personal insights born out of our own experiences. Allow me please to share mine. The greatest privilege I feel is having a father who unlike most Chinese fathers, made my two older sisters and I believe that we were equal in capacity and potential to that of our two younger brothers. This was unique because our family business is in shipping, which to this day is very much a male dominated industry. We were brought up listening to our father speak of business as if we were part of management, he was patient with our questions and kept an open ear to our opinions. Young as we were then, he would bring us to bank meetings and visit ship's visitations. I would always find myself being assigned to host dinners or representing him in meetings, even at a very young age. So much so that when I entered the business world, I could no longer see the difference between men and women. There were, however, two milestones that made me realize that there are great differences. There was a time when my competitors would bring customers to junkets abroad, or for that matter, play golf, something that I found difficult to do as a woman. When I told my father that I, as a woman, might be a business liability, he gave me lesson number one. He said, 
Do not try to be something you are not, because you will fail. Do not be afraid to be yourself. I therefore had to work three times harder to be operationally excellent and efficient and more caring for our customers in ways that women can. From my experience, I believe that women have a clear and unique character that must be nurtured and not try to be like a man. When my daughter had her children and struggled between home and the office, I learned my lesson number two. The workplace generally assumes that there is someone taking care of the children and el elderly parents at home. Work suffers from the main caregiver of the children um, having 50% of her, or for that matter, his mind worrying about the family. I have realized the stress I have felt throughout my career had nothing to do with the work, but instead with worry about the children's well-being, about missing recitals and baseball games, about not being able to pick them up from school. Statistics show that women are as well educated as men and work with as much enthusiasm and competence, but fall off in an M curve because they, when they start having a family. This loss of talent is called the leaking pipeline experienced by many companies. What this phenomenon is also telling us is that the proportion of women graduating with university degrees is not translating to similar proportions of roles in top management. These two lessons made me realize that both the public and private sectors must create an environment and provide infrastructure that celebrates the uniqueness of a woman on one hand and recognizes that a woman's success in business must also allow success at home on the other. As the chair illustrated, what is hopeful is that technology is allowing more companies to offer flexible, flexible work hours and work from home programs. E-commerce is allowing more women to, to participate in business while working from home. A self-employed businesswoman selling goods and services over the internet or working part-time through internet platforms that enable them to use their excess capacity in, ex in the expanding sharing economy. These discussions today and removing the barriers that hold women back in the workforce, that hold them from succeeding in entrepreneurial pursuits, that hold them back from having access to the internet and the great potential that it offers, are important inputs to the process to remove the barriers to inclusion and advancement of women in the workforce and in business so that no one is left behind. The members of the APEC Business Advisory Council, past and present, who are also here for this dialogue, join me in thanking the organizers for bringing us together. I, for one, am honored and proud to have become an added link to this great chain, this great sisterhood that will change the world as a new nexus of force. I thank you all very much and hope you all have an enjoyable day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doris Maxey Saiho. Once again, we welcome everyone to the public private dialogue on women and the economy of the APIC Women and the Economy 2015 Fora Women as Prime Movers of Inclusive Growth. First on our agenda is a talk on harnessing the power of a crowd. To give this talk, she is the CEO and Executive Director of Rappler, a social news network that combines the best of professional journalism with citizen journalism and crowdsourcing. She has been a journalist in Asia for more than 25 years, most of them as CNN's Bureau Chief in Manila from 1987 to 1995, then in Jakarta from 1995 to 2005, to give a talk on harnessing the power of the crowd, please welcome Miss Maria Ressa. Good morning, good morning. Wow, what an amazing group of people. Uh, just coming in this morning, the energy was fantastic. Uh, good to see old friends. Thank you so much for asking me to talk to you about this. What I'm going to do is outline a threat and an opportunity. 
and uh, hopefully scare you as much as I got scared when I looked at all these statistics. So let's start with where we are in the world today. And let's, I'm going to start with this. More than 50% of the people here are CEOs, MDs, and founders of their companies. We know this. Every business today is an internet business. Let me explain why. Let's look at the reality. Here's the market cap to a billion. And look at it from when it took 20 years for a typical Fortune 500 company, all the way to just 2012, it took two years for Oculus Rift. You guys familiar with Oculus Rift? They were crowdfunded and then bought by Facebook for $1.2 billion in 2012. That's just one, right? So let's look at some of the other things that gave me, that made me think this is creative destruction. The things we learned. When I was with CNN, it would take us five years for an operating system before we had to replace it. So, you know, it was built into our DNA that we would get used to basis and then we'd move to something else. But five years, it took us a while to learn it. Well, here we go. The average half-life of a business competency dropped from 30 years in 1984 to five years in 2014. So you can kind of see how fast change is going. Let's go to the next. Here's another one. 89% of the Fortune 500 companies from 1955 are not, are not on the list in 2014. Creative destruction. Here's another one. S&P 500 companies lifespan. It used to be 67 years in the 1920s. This is as of two years ago. The now of two years ago it was 15, and I would wager it's decreased even more today. Here's the next one that is a cautionary tale for all of us. In the next decade, 40% of all S&P 500 companies will disappear from the list. 40%. Can you see how our world is changing? Mark Andreessen said this, that software is eating the world. And these are just a few of the, thing, the businesses that have already transitioned. And the reason I point this out is because I think the threat is actually an opportunity for us in emerging nations and for women. And I'll, you can see some of these things. Look at how advertising, Google now ha has the lion's share of advertising, but they didn't exist before, right? CDs, how many people still have CDs? I know, I do too, I love the, but I also have Spotify and I have Apple Music, um, telecoms. It's a tough, tough challenge for telecoms because they had to move from 90% of their business on landlines all the way to who uses Vibers for long, Viber for long distance calls, right? So you can see how much, again, the rest of it, I've got to tell you newspapers and television to Rappler because I'm, I'm Rappler. So <laughs> I will, I, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But this is the graph that is changing our world. This is the graph that shows our world. It is the move from linear growth to exponential growth. And what I try to do with Rapplers by harnessing technology and the internet, I want to move from that linear growth that we used to have when I used to handle a large media group here we would say if we had you know, a, a two-digit growth rate, we would be so wonderfully thrilled. But look at the exponential growth of tech companies, Airbnb, Uber. Uh, Airbnb owns no hotel rooms, and yet it's now the largest hotel, hotel chain in the world, right? Um, made up of all of us. Uh, so this is what we're trying to do in Rapplers, to move into that place of disruption. I think that's the opportunity for all of us. And this is where I think it began. It began with social media. Okay, raise your hand. Who here has social media? Who has Facebook or Twitter account? Who has? Facebook, Twitter. Wonderful. Why don't you raise your hand? Who does not? Who distrusts social media? All right, you're from Asia Pacific. Well, you're from the Philippines. It's like 94% of the people on the internet are on Facebook. So when did it begin, this period of disruption? July 2009. And it, that's the Google trend that shows you when social media picked up. Why? These are the stats from then. But the one I really want you to look at is the one in the middle, which says 
social media has overtaken pornography as the number one activity on the web. So that is the tipping point for this creative destruction. Why? Because on, in July 2009, so from the time the internet had been created until July 2009, pornography was the number one innovator, the number one activity on the web. But in July 2009, social media overtook pornography. Why? The academic studies actually show us why. Because of things like this. It's nicer in a cartoon, because I do this for, for college students a lot, but um, I can send you the studies from Stanford, from Cornell. Stanford University did a study of people on social media, and they did fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging scans, brain scans of people who are on the internet, on, on social media. And they found that if you're on Facebook or you're on Twitter, that you have higher levels of certain chemicals and hormones. So, for example, if you're on Facebook, Chit Juan is next to me, and she's sitting there tweeting, right? So I know she's got higher levels of something called dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter that causes mild addiction. Mild addiction. When you're, do you ever notice when you're on Facebook, it's very hard to get off, right? You, so imagine this for your kids. So e elevated levels of dopamine, it's a neurotransmitter. You also have ele elevated levels of something, of a hormone called oxytocin, among other things. Oxytocin is important because it's also called the love hormone, the sex hormone, right? Breastfeeding, yes. When a woman gives birth, her body is chock full of oxytocin. Women give love, right? So, I mean, that's, that's what social media taps into. And if you look at that, when you're on social media, you kind of feel like you're jumping off a plane, like you're having um, drugs, alcohol, and you're having sex. So why not replace pornography with social media? Because your brain is telling you this, the feelings are similar, right? You're laughing. But it's, it's so fascinating, because think about it now. Every business has a direct touch point with its consumers. You no longer need mediators. So this is what we did in Rappler. Um, I moved from managing a thousand journalists in the largest network in the Philippines to in less than a year, starting a startup with 12 people. So this is how we began it. And this is the little micro I'll show you on it. First. We broke down all the walls because to take advantage of this new world, you need to get rid of the boundaries and the sp specialties because it's the pace of the flow of information. And if you can move your business to that pace, your growth will go. But growth must be built into the design. It isn't a business dilemma alone. Growth is a designed problem of your managers. So this is what we did. We tried to figure out what things are there. This is one of our, our first. So we took the 40-somethings. We were 40-something when we began, four of us. And then the rest, we hired 20-somethings, the youngest, smartest millennials, digital natives I could find. And then we gave them a lot of things to do. I hope they're not watching this. <laughs> this is Natasha Gutierrez. She started with us out of college. She moved from New York, left a really well-paying job to come home to the Philippines. Um, we're, we started in 2012, so now um, she just moved to Jakarta as our Jakarta bureau chief. But you see her here with the thing we made up. This is now an off-the-shelf um, case for an iPhone, but your iPhone actually is HD quality video. So we made a metal case for it. We had it built, and then we outfitted her the way we would the TV cameras that are there, right? And she went out. Here's another one, Ai Makaraig, another one of our reporters. Look at her. She's sitting there talking to that contraption that we created, and then the two guys behind her are former ca our cameramen with ABS-CBN, my former network. And they're laughing at her because she's sitting there talking to that tripod, right? She's, she's actually doing a piece to camera. But you know, people stop laughing after a little while. Uh, the picture was taken by a good friend, our, our anchor, a form, um, former, she's the anchor of ABS-CBN, Cesc Drillon. She sent me the picture because, again, it's funny. Innovation looks funny. But then when you realize that 
all she needed to do was to tap her phone for that to go public, while the big cameras needed to wade through traffic, get to home base, transfer their video, edit their video before the public can see it. You can see how the pace of information can dictate change, right? Right now, we're live, we're live there, I think, or you're recording, but I just set up a little phone, iPhone there, it's live on Periscope, live streaming. That is how much things have changed. You no longer need an OB van to go live. And there's your other thing, an OB van costs a million dollars, right? Now we can do it with a cell phone. That just shows you, sorry, I get very excited about stuff like this. Um, let me just um, quickly go through, because I want to take your questions. This is, these are the ideas for Rappler, and I want to show you two examples of things anyone can do, and things we can do together. Here's the other part about this brave new world. This is not a world where one brand carries it alone. This is actually a, a, an amazing collaborative world, because that is how you harness the crowd. So this is Rappler. We made up the name. And you know, that goes against the DNA of a journalist. I was the last one to kind of agree to it. What is Rappler? Rap means to talk for us. And then ripple, to make waves. Our core is still journalism, the discipline of journalism. I am a traditional journalist at core. But if you build DNA into our DNA, if you build technology into it, it changes it slightly. And then you got to build the crowd. Whatever your business is, think about how to shift it online and then how are you going to make your consumers, your users, part of your business? That's the idea. Then you put it smack here. This is where we are. Rappler, smack in the middle of that. And these were the three tools we used. That thing that created that exponential growth, social media. If you're on social media, we use it for engagement. We use it for crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing leading to big data. And this is not just our content model, it's our business model as well. It works. Um, well, it works so far. Let's see, right? This is the first, so just now, this is this morning. Alexa is Amazon.com. Um, you can see here, these are the top news sites in the Philippines. And again, what's fascinating is you don't need a million dollars. Well, we raised a lot more, but um, you don't need a million dollars to do this. One person can do it. That's what's fun. Crowdsourcing. On Rappler, you can see a, use, a patented user engagement model. Every story, you click how you feel. When you click, the vote goes to the mood navigator and the back end. It's aggregated. And then we can do things. Our advertisers are interested in this. Society should be interested in this. Look at the month of May 2013 in moods. You can actually see that 77% were happy. And you can also see that on election day itself, it was predominantly angry because, and we knew exactly when it turned angry, when the results from the PCOS machine slowed down. And then everyone started voting angry. Um, again, just a few of the executions you can do. I want to show you this. This is the God's eye view of our human behavior, of our society. Hashtag Japan is um, the Fukushima reactor incident, the earthquake in 2011. That is how human beings behave in crisis. We form hubs around sources of information, and those are government and media, right? Why could it not be your organization if you are an expert in a field? Hashtag GOP, the last US presidential elections. Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. You don't have to survey them, you just have to look at their behavior on Twitter and you can see how divided Americans were between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. Hashtag Egypt, that's what a revolution looks like on, on social media. And you can kind of see an implosion, right? And then hashtag Syria is 16 months into the civil war between President Bashar al-Assad. Well, I don't even know whether to call it a civil war anymore. Let's go to the Philippines, something nice in the Philippines. Ah, click, ayomo. <laughs> One more time, can you click for me? Thank you. This is January this year. So I was gonna show you the anti-corruption protest rally. Um, it worked, hashtag million people march. I can show you that later on, but I wanna show you the nice thing because we're gonna prepare um, to jump. This is the first hour the Pope arrived in the Philippines. And this is the conversation on Twitter in the first hour. The circles, 
the sizes of the circles um, are based on eigenvector centrality, which is basically um, how influential that account is. But the other part about that is that it's like Google PageRank. So it's not just how many you know, it is also like in the real world, who you know, who you're talking to, right? Now if you just zoom in, you can see, and I just, we just took out some of the noise and you can see at Pontifex, the Pope is there. And then these are Little Rappler and I know we're on TV so I won't say my old network, but there is no way in the world a decade ago that a group that is so much smaller could actually um, com be comparable and sometimes beat in stories a large organization. If you run a large organization, look to innovate because the new players who are coming in with the digital tools have opportunities you may miss and that is what it can do. Okay, the last thing I wanna show you is just this and I wanna ask for your help in this one. Project Agos is something that we built in the Philippines because we have a, an average of 20 typhoons every year. And if you build a tech platform, you can harness bottom-up civic engagement with top-down government workflows. And that's actually what this does. Um, we've now expanded, collaboration is the word. Um, we're now working with Ateneo's uh, school, at actually their innovation school that their, Rene Estuar has built something called Ibayanihan. We're putting them all together to do things like this. When a typhoon or a disaster strikes, anyone can report it to a transparent, where it's a map anyone can see, public sector, private sector. You can report information, you can report calls for help. All you have to do is you can tweet it, you can put it on Facebook, you can also use SMS. Our two telcos are actually giving free SMS for this. And then the last one is you can post it on the site. Um, look at some of the things. We, we launched it in 20, well actually we launched it one month before Typhoon Yolanda. Super Typhoon Yolanda hit. And when we launched it, people told, my friends told me, why are you so concerned about this? Because it's life. This is our life today. So take a look at some of the things. NDRRMC, the Office of Civil Defense, DILG. Um, we have a civic engagement arm that's working with governments. And you have things like this. Someone's calling for help. Baby and two yayas trapped at second floor. And then you see people jumping on them with their location. And then you have NDRRMC actually asking, Ma'am, kamusta na po kayo dyan? How are you? And the first responders are the ones responding to the people directly. Right? That's kind of cool. And then the, la the last one, I want you to just see the rescue alert. May babaeng naglelabor sa ibabaw ng bubong. There's a woman in labor on the roof. And you can see at the tail end, she was rescued by the Philippine Red Cross. This is a way of being transparent and of having everyone with a stake do something about it. I'll end it with this minute video that shows you the first time Agos hit a tipping point. It's crowdsourced, the video is crowdsourced, everything there is crowdsourced. Help can come from the crowd. Here we go. Typhoon Glenda, known internationally as Ramasun, intensifies as it moves closer to the Bicol summer area Tuesday. Normal people posted these things, right? And government agencies. And then what you can see there, um, the, we put data on the map that shows you where flooding can happen and where landslides can happen. That is publicly available government data. And then take a look. Journalists couldn't be in all these places at the same time, but because people are there, they are. PWH, DSWD, all of these agencies can directly talk to the people, which they actually do now.
it is an amazing time. Um, Move PH is working with, with DSWD. I see Secretary Soliman there, and I know she's had a really jam-packed 2013, 2014. I mean, it's, this is a time when we can come together, we can use technology to help solve age-old problems. It isn't just, if you're in this room, you know this, you don't just rely on government, we can help. And I think technology, women, magic combination. Good luck to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Marie Aressa. So, I, I'm also your moderator for the other panel, so I'm switching hats now. Um, to prepare for our panel session on the global gender picture, let's first hear from the World Economic Forum to, regarding the progress of gender-based disparities in the world economy. To give this global gender report, we have Ms. Saadia Sahidi, the Senior Director and Head of Gender Parity Program, Human Capital, and Special Constituents of the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. Um, Ms. Sahidi couldn't be with us today. Instead, here's a video of her report. To prepare for our panel discussion on the global gender picture, let's first hear from the World Economic Forum as to the progress of gender-based disparities in the world economy. To give the global gender gap report, we have Ms. Saadia Zahidi, the Senior Director and Head of Gender Parity Program, Human Capital, and Special Constituents of the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. Unfortunately, Ms. Zahidi could not be with us today. Instead, we have a video of her entire report. Please watch this. In order for the world to close gender gaps, it's very important that we track them and measure them over time. This report tries to do exactly that. We try to understand the gaps between women and men on health, education, economic participation, and political empowerment. We're trying to understand whether women have the same rights and opportunities as men, regardless of whether they're in rich countries or poor countries. In 2014, we cover 142 economies. While no country in the world has fully closed the gender gap, the Nordic countries have closed over 80% of it. Iceland, Finland, Norway, Sweden and Denmark occupy the top five spots in the rankings. Rwanda enters the rankings for the first time this year. The Philippines at number nine is the highest ranking Asian country. The US comes back into the top 20 while the UK slips down to 26. Out of the BRICS countries, South Africa is the highest ranking country at number 18, followed by Brazil at 71, Russia at 75, China at 87, and India at 114. Out of the Arab countries, Kuwait is the highest ranking at 113, followed by the UAE at 115. The bottom three countries remain Chad, Pakistan, and Yemen. We now have nine years of data, almost a decade worth of information. Out of the 111 countries that have been covered since 2006, 105 have been making progress. What's also positive is where the change is coming from. Saudi Arabia, relative to itself, is the country that has made the most progress on economic participation. In the case of education, it's Burkina Faso. But there are countries that are falling backwards. 30% of countries are losing the gains they've made on education, and nearly 40% are moving backwards on health. People and their talents are the key resource that drives most economies. But the benefits of gender equality go beyond the economic case. Women are one half of the world's population. They deserve equal access to health, education, earning potential, and political empowerment. Because ultimately, gender equality is a vital part of humanity's progress. Thank you to the World Economic Forum and to Ms. Zahadia Zahidi for presenting us the Global Gender Gap Report. We will now be going to short intermission. Please remain seated as we will begin the program shortly. We encourage all delegates to take this time to download the APEC WE 2015 Forum mobile app 
The app gives you instant access to information on the forum, including speaker profiles, live news updates, and social media posts from participants. It also features the audience response system, where delegates can send out their own Twitter updates and, more importantly, post questions and votes during the panel discussions. Delegates who wish to have full participation in today's dialogues must download the EPIC We 2015 for a mobile app to access the audience response system. Download the EPIC We 2015 for a mobile app on Google Play for Android users and App Store for Apple users. It is also available on your browser. Simply enter the URL www.app dot sli dot do on your browser and enter the hashtag apec 2015ph as the event code to access the audience response system for all social media posts please make use of the hashtag apec 2015ph Also additional, once downloaded, click the gear setting button on the top left and press update content for the latest updates. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Benigno S. Aquino III, President of the Republic of the Philippines.
Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the APEC Women and Economy 2015 Public Private Dialogue on Women and the Economy with the theme Women as Prime Movers of Inclusive Growth. May we call on the Secretary of the Department of Trade and Industry, the Honorable Gregory L. Domingo, to welcome and introduce our guests of honor and speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, especially the foreign delegates, welcome to the Philippines. It is my honor and privilege to introduce the President of the Republic of the Philippines, His Excellency Benigno S. Aquino III. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Please down. Secretary Greg Domingo, other members of the cabinet present, excellencies, heads of delegations and participants to the APEC Women and the Economy 2015 Forum, Under Secretary Nora Terrado, Under Secretary Emeline Versosa, Under Secretary Maria Aurora Giotina Garcia, the Chair, a very energetic Doris Magsaysayo, fellow, fellow workers in government, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, again, good morning. I am no stranger to the strength of women, countless stories of their fortitude, resilience, and love for country can be found in the pages of our history books. There is Gabriela Silang, one of our nation's most renowned heroes, who led the revolt against our colonizers after her husband's assassination. There is Tandang Sora, who put up a refuge for wounded soldiers during yet another revolution against the Spanish occupation. Of course, a more recent and much more personal example is my mother, who I watched firsthand as she courageously took a stand against a vicious dictator and led the country in reclaiming our democracy. Make no mistake, the willpower of these Filipinas showed is not a rare trait. It is something we see every day. For instance, back in 1984, when my mother was leading the movement against the dictator, there was this woman in Cebu who always joined the rallies in Cebu. We knew her to be so passionate in the struggle against the dictatorship that when everyone was clamoring for the dictator to resign, she was literally calling for his head. Another thing that set her apart was that she always carried a basket with her containing clean underwear, a toothbrush, some instant coffee, and other essential items. It led me to ask her, why do you bring all of these to a political rally? Her answer, she was ready to be arrested anytime. <laughs> Excuse me. That woman's dedication has burned itself into my memory as one of the clearest examples of conviction for one's beliefs. Of course, in the modern era, we have no shortage of excellent women leaders, no less dedicated to uplifting the lives of others. One of those who comes to mind is Marefe Zamora, a crucial member of the leadership of a well-known ITBPM firm. When my term started, she offered to join government to help with our reform efforts. And I said that maybe she can help even more by staying in our sector and aiding the economy by expanding their workforce. At the time, they had around 20,000 employees, and my request was to increase it to 30,000 before our term ends. Five years into our term, their company is providing not 30,000 jobs, but 60,000 jobs to all other Filipinos. In fact, I was told recently that the only limiting factor to the jobs they can provide is the amount of office space available on EDSA, which is Metro Manila's main thoroughfare. Her company's performance makes me very glad that I declined her offer to move to government. With so many women that are, more often than not, more strong-willed and capable than men, is it any surprise that the common Filipino male never questions the authority of Filipinas? <laughs> I believe it is intrinsic to our society. We see women as superior in many aspects, including prudent budgeting and focusing on the advancement of the family as a whole. 
I'm certain that all Filipinos have their own examples in mind of women who serve as role models and heroes. That is precisely why we're here, to express our collective belief that harnessing the talents and potential of all women can bring about inclusive progress sooner rather than later. Our administration is an ex excellent example of this belief put into action. Over the course of our term, we have appointed a good number of women of unquestionable moral standing to key positions in government so that they may enact much needed reforms in the various sectors. There is Ombudsman Conchita Carpio Morales, Secretary Laila de Lima of the Department of Justice, Secretary Dinky Suleiman of the Department of Social Welfare and Development, Secretary Janet Garin of the Department of Health, Secretary Lilia de Lima of the Philippine Economic Zone Authority, Commissioner Kim Menares of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, former head of the Commission on Audit, Grace Polidutan, amongst many others. Over the last five years, these women have bullishly pursued necessary reforms to, and have refused to back down, even in the face of those with great power and influence and deeply entrenched interests. They are pillars of our administration's reform agenda, and they are living proof to young people who wish to enter public service that they will not be defined by their gender but rather by their integrity, their work ethic, and their willingness to serve. The contributions of women to Philippine society have, of course, gone beyond the public sector and have helped spur our remarkable economic growth these past few years. According to the Department of Trade and Industry, 54% of all registered trade names are owned by women. The Asian Institute of Management also conducted a survey that revealed that about 63% of managers and owners of businesses are women. One major sector they are all involved in are micro, small, and medium enterprises, which accounts for 63.7% of our total employment. Seeing these numbers, one has to wonder, myself included, if perhaps in 10 years' time, gender equality in the Philippines will be about men's emancipation and no longer women's emancipation. Actually, some of our married brethren are telling me that it will not happen in 10 years. It's actually a goal that should be reached now. Our goal is to have an inclusive economy, and if it is clear that women are the better partners towards having inclusive growth, then it behooves government to provide them even more opportunities, or to provide even more opportunities to women entrepreneurs. Take, for example, our Technical Educational and Skills Development Authority's partnership with Coca-Cola for the Test the Star program, which stands for the Sari Sari Store Training and Access to Resources program. Sari Sari stores are very small neighborhood retail stores in the Philippines. Through this initiative, we are training women Sari Sari store owners in bookkeeping, inventory management, accounting, and other disciplines, essentially helping them to professionalize and formalize their approach towards typically informal enterprises. Even better, we are also, I'm told, teaching them already how to maximize the utility of their new profits. From December of 2011 to June of this year, this program has produced 33,315 graduates with the goal of eventually training around 200,000 Filipinas. We are already hearing of so many success stories. For instance, there was one owner who used to earn just 800 pesos a day. After going through the program, her daily earnings reached 4,000 pesos. This is in fact equivalent to my salary before all the necessary deductions and I assume that she earns it with considerably less stress. <laughs> Congress has also passed laws that expand the horizon of opportunities for women. Most prominently, in 2011, we repealed antiquated provisions of the labor code that prohibit women from working at night. It comes as no surprise then that according to the World Economic Forum, the Philippines is the only Asian country in the top 10 in terms of closing the gender gap. But, but make no mistake, our performance in this index will not stop us from pursuing even more progress. Women still face a number of pressing issues, and the issue of gender equality calls for continuous reflection and corresponding action. For this reason, we must always approach our jobs and even our smallest interactions with people with the empathy, consideration, and respect necessary to create a truly inclusive society. 
Rest assured, the Philippines will remain your partner in expanding opportunities for women, and I am hopeful that your discussions today will continue to move us closer to a world where no one is left behind. Thank you. Good day. Thank you, Mr. President. May we request the President to remain on stage for the photo opportunity in four batches. We welcome on stage the APEC WE 2015 Forum Ministers and Heads of Delegation. Thank you very much. And the uh, second batch will join the heads of the delegation and the organizing team, the Honorable Gregory L. Domingo, APIC We 2015, for Chair Yusek Nora K. Tarado, Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho, Ms. Emmeline L. Versosa, Ms. Maria Aurora Boots, Chutina Garcia, and SOM Chair Laura Del Rosario. Thank you very much to the organizing team. The third batch with the heads of the delegation and distinguished female government officials. Thank you, distinguished female government officials. And the last batch with the heads of the delegation and our speakers and moderators. Thank you, speakers and moderators. Thank you, Mr. President. That's the end of our program with the President. We want to thank again President Benigno S. Aquino III. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, President Benigno S. Aquino III. Thank you. Mabuhay po tayong lahat.